Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. So I saw that a couple people had made videos about the derivative of x factorial. And there's a fairly simple way to think about this. Instead of writing x factorial, you think about the gamma function evaluated at x, which is some sort of continuation of the factorial function as defined on non-negative integers. And I think this is a pretty interesting question. And those videos made about this question are quite nice. But that being said, I thought of this kind of interesting related question, and that is, what is the factorial of the derivative operator? So in other words, what do we get if we take the factorial of the derivative operator and then act on a function? So I haven't really seen this done anywhere, but my take is that since the derivative is a linear transformation, and we have a standard way of applying functions to linear transformations via diagonalizing them in a certain basis or finding a Jordan form in a certain basis or something like that, then we can apply a factorial to the derivative viewed as a linear transformation. But we have to restrict which space we're looking at, and I think we'll get different answers depending on different spaces that we're looking at. So let's start with this first setting, which is fairly simple. And that is we'll consider the vector space, which I'll call V, and it'll be the span of these two exponential functions, e to the 3x and e to the 4x. Although you could extend this so that it's quite a bit larger if you wanted to. Okay, and then we'll think about V as being an isomorphic vector space to R2. And that isomorphism will be given that given by the assignment of e to the 3x with the column vector 1, 0, and e to the 4x with the column vector 0, 1. And then from there, we'll build up a commutative diagram. So let's go from v to v via taking the derivative. And then we'll go down here to r2. Then we'll go down here to R2 as well. And then we'll define a matrix here called D. And let's trace our basis vectors through here. So e to the 3x will be sent to 1, 0. But in this direction, it's sent to 3 times e to the 3x. But sending that down here, that will be 3, 0. So putting this all together, we see that the vector 1, 0 is sent to the vector 3, 0. Now we'll do the same thing with e to the 4x. So e to the 4x will be sent to the vector 0, 1. It'll also be mapped over here via the derivative to 4e to the 4x, which gets mapped down here to 0, 4. So we need our matrix D, which is representing this derivative, to take this basis vector 1, 0 to 3, 0, and this basis vector 0, 1 to 4, 0. So that tells us that our matrix D should simply be the diagonal matrix 3, 0, 0, 4. But now from here, I think there's a logical way of finding the factorial of this matrix. So I would say the factorial of this matrix would just be the factorial of the diagonal elements. Great. And so this is the standard way of applying a function to a matrix. Here that function is this taking the factorial action. Okay, but then we know 3 factorial is 6 and 4 factorial is 24. So we have this diagonal matrix 6, 0, 0, 24. And so it stands to reason that in this setting, if we were to take the factorial of the derivative operator and operate on e to the 3x, we would get 6 e to the 3x. Just by building a diagram that's very, very similar to this. And furthermore, if we were to take the factorial of the derivative function and apply it to e to the 4x, it seems like we'll get 24e to the 4x. So something like that. Okay, but this case is very specialized in that the derivative is already diagonalized with the choice of our basis up here for our vector space V. So let's maybe look at a case when it's not only not diagonalized, but not even diagonalizable. 
If you're looking to start your own domain, personal website, or online store, look no further than Squarespace. As a mathematician that's from the 22nd century, you heard that right, I'm a time traveler. Online presence is going to become a focal point for employers everywhere. We need to step up our website game. Too many math websites are stuck in the 1990s. Squarespace has tons of templates that offer awesome customization options with no coding required. Although you can access the code if you'd like to. For example, there's a very easy LaTeX integration that I have on my website, you know, for your equations and such. Whether you're already running an online store or have just begun your journey into web design, Squarespace has tools that you need to succeed. So what are you waiting for? Go check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Michael Penn to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So for our next example, we'll look at the derivative operating on the space of polynomials of degree two or less. So in other words, all polynomials of the form a plus bx plus cx squared. So notice if we were to take the derivative of this polynomial, a plus bx plus cx squared, we would simply get b plus 2cx using the power rule. So now let's push this to a matrix representation. So here we have p2 being mapped to p2 by the derivative. And then we can assign this to r3. That's because this is maybe clearly three-dimensional, where we push this quadratic polynomial to the three vector a, b, c, like that. And then we'll again make a matrix D, which will do the same thing as this derivative up here, but down in the vector world. So this will also go to R3, and then we'll map down as well. So let's trace an element through so we have a feel for how this works. So let's take a polynomial, so that'll be A plus bx plus cx squared. So mapped down here will give us this vector a, b, c. Mapped over here with the derivative gives us b plus 2cx. And then that mapped down here will go to b, 2c, 0. Great. So now seeing that a, b, c gets mapped to b, 2, c, 0 gives us a formula for d. And that formula for d goes like this. It should be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 2, and then 0, 0, 0. Great. So notice if we were to multiply this matrix into this vector a, b, c, we would most definitely achieve this vector b, 2, c, 0. So this d matrix is doing the same as this derivative, just in kind of this r3 world instead of this p2 world. And now our goal is to find the factorial of this d matrix. But finding the factorial of this is a little bit more difficult because it's not diagonal. In fact, it's not even diagonalizable. You can check that this only has a single eigenvector, and that eigenvector has an eigenvalue of zero, and that eigenvector has geometric multiplicity of one, meaning that it's not diagonalizable. So we're gonna use this following lemma to help us apply the factorial to this derivative matrix. And it goes like this. So if we have this power series expansion of F, although we'll quickly forget that we have this power series expansion, so it's as the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of a sub n x to the n, and then we've got a matrix A, which is definitely not diagonal. In fact, it has the same sort of format that this has. So zero lambda zero, zero zero mu, and then zero zero zero. Then if you square a, you get 0, 0, lambda times mu, and then all of the rest zeros. Then furthermore, a cubed, a to the fourth, a to the fifth, so on and so forth, will just give us the zero matrix. So that means if you plug in a into this function here, you only get three terms. You get a zero times the identity matrix, a one times our original matrix, and then finally, a2 times this square of a. 
and all of the higher terms go to zero from this fact right here. So putting this all together, we'll have f evaluated at a is f of zero on the diagonal. So notice f evaluated at zero will definitely just give us a sub zero. And then we'll have lambda f prime of zero in this first off diagonal entry, mu times f prime of zero in this off diagonal entry. And that's because we have a sub one is related to that first derivative. And then here we'll have lambda times mu times f double prime of zero. And that's because what's attached to this capital A squared term. And now keeping that in mind, we can take this d factorial. So let's do that. So here we have d factorial, but now let's fill in our matrix. So instead of putting zero factorial along the diagonal, I'm gonna put the gamma function evaluated at one. So let's recall up here that the gamma function evaluated at one is equal to zero factorial. In fact, the gamma function evaluated at n plus one is equal to n factorial, like in more generality. But since we're talking about derivatives right here, here, and second derivatives here, we really need to put it in terms of the gamma function so we know how to take derivatives. And we're gonna use some facts about the derivative of the gamma function. Okay, so let's put gamma function evaluated at one here, keeping in mind that that's the same thing as zero factorial based off of this kind of setup over here. And then here we'll have the gamma function prime evaluated at one. And then here we'll have two times the gamma function double prime evaluated at one. Then we'll have zero gamma of one, two times gamma prime of one, and then zero, zero gamma one. Great, so we have something like that. And so that's based off of this lemma over here, which I haven't proven, but it's not so hard to prove, applied to our D matrix, where we just think about this factorial being extended into this gamma function. Okay, so now let's do this evaluation. So zero factorial, in other words, gamma evaluated at one is one. And then the derivative of the gamma function evaluated at one is minus little gamma, where that's one of Euler's constants. And then the second derivative evaluated at one and then multiplied by two will give us two little gamma squared and then plus pi squared over three. So notice that's just twice pi squared over six. In other words, the famous Basel problem. So it's related to the Riemann zeta function, which is pretty interesting. And now we can fill in the rest. So we'll have zero, one, and then minus two gamma, and then zero, zero, one. So we have something like this. So now the cool thing here is that this allows us to push back to the factorial of the derivative evaluated on these polynomials. And so instead of doing it on a general second degree polynomial, let's do it just on the basis vectors. So the factorial of this derivative operator on x squared ends up being this matrix multiplied onto the vector zero, zero, one, because that's the vector that plays the role of x squared and then pushed back into polynomial world. So in the end, that's gonna give us two gamma squared plus pi squared over three minus gamma x and then plus x squared. So that's because that gives us the vector whose first entry is this, second entry is minus gamma, and third entry is one by matrix vector multiplication. And then furthermore, we'll see that the factorial of the de derivative operator applied to x will give us minus gamma plus x. And that's just by repeating this where we apply this matrix to the vector zero, one, zero instead. And then I'll leave it to you to do the same sort of thing and see that the, the factorial of the derivative operator on the constant one just gives us the number one. So now you could put these three things together to see what it does to something in general. But in fact, what we do is just retrieve this matrix representation just pushed into this polynomial world. So just as a note, this is my take on what it means to take the 
factorial of the derivative operator. And I guess my take is that it really depends on the setting. So as we saw in that very simple exponential function setting, there's not much going on. But in this polynomial world setting, there's quite a bit more going on. And if we had pushed to higher degree polynomials, we most definitely would have gotten more crazy formulas like this. And if we had worked with other functions, we would have gotten different structure. So maybe post down in the comments what your take on the factorial of the derivative operator would be. And let's see if we come up with the right idea. And that's a good place to stop. Music